Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Listen, this is my message this morning. Amen. At the end of this message this morning, I hope and pray that we would be able to have come to these altars and that we would spend time in the presence of the Lord. Uh, Aaron, we might even pass out communion uh, and and take communion at the, at the you know before the service is over with. Chris, as a matter of fact, why don't you go get that box of communion real quick and just start passing it out as we get ready and we'll, we'll take communion together at the end. Amen. We're going to let the Lord move. Have you ever taken communion before at your house? Amen. You and the Lord. Praise God. That's a powerful thing. Amen. If you've done it, you know what I'm talking about. Communion is a beautiful thing. I always like that word. I like words. I know you've noticed that. Co- communion, common union. We have a common union in Christ, and what has pulled us together is the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what, that's what we have in common with one another in this house this morning, is that we all love Jesus. We've all looked to him. We've, we all believe. Amen. We might be in different places in our walk. Look, I don't mean that in the wrong way. I mean that in the most loving kind of way. We might all be at different places in our walk, but we should all have something in common. And what we should have in common is that we love Jesus and that we believe he died on the cross for our sin. Amen. You know what else is beautiful about communion is that it reminds us that we have access to the presence of God. When we take communion together corporately or even individually, it's an opportunity for us to remember the cross to remember what Jesus did for us, and to understand, amen, that we have access into the presence of God. And also to remember that one day he said, I'm coming back again. Amen. He's coming back again, my friend. Praise God. And so look, when it's all said and done, we're going to take communion. I think whenever we take, uh, I've been trying to do something a little bit different. It, just always want to try to be led by the Spirit. I don't want to be like a robot, you know what I'm saying? Just like go... You know, I'm a very, I'm a very preacher, teacher kind of guy. But I want, I want the Holy Spirit to be able to move in the midst of all of that, and He wants to. Trust me, Amen. So y'all just got to pray for me, Amen, that I don't become a robot. But look, one of the things that has been very powerful whenever I would take communion at my house is is being able to just flow in the Spirit and to be led by the Lord. And so, at the end of this service, what's going to happen is the musicians are going to come up here. And as, they're, as they are, um, you know, leading us in a song, you're going to just worship the Lord. Amen? You're just going to worship the Lord. You're going to tell him how much you love him. Amen? You're going to tell him how grateful you are. We're gonna, we'll take communion at the very end of the service, okay? So you're going to, but I'm, we're just getting this out the way right now, right? But what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to tell Jesus how much you love him, how thankful you are. Somebody was sharing with me the other day just about, he said, he broke the, before he broke the bread, he gave thanks. How many times do we not really realize and, and thankful for what he's already given us? Amen. So we're going to just thank him this morning. Amen. We're going to thank him and we're going to give him glory and honor. And as you're worshiping the Lord, when you feel led by the Lord, listen, you can come up to the altar. As a matter of fact, I want to remind you that the altar is a good place to be. Amen. Listen, the altar is a beautiful place to be, my friend. Just because you come up to this altar, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to be thinking, oh, there they are. About time they made it up here. You know, oh, Lord, they should have. No, 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 no. I'm going to be like, thank you, Lord, for ministering to their heart. Lord, bless them. Sometimes, sometimes it's not even the people that are all bound up with, with things in their life. It's the people that are free. <laughs> That's really, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, because they know why they're free. Because it was an altar called Calvary, a tree on Calvary that set them free. And so they come to the altar for self to die so that Jesus can be exalted because he's worthy. Amen. So when you're taking communion, you're welcome to come to the altar. You're welcome to do it in your seat. But I just want to remind you, and thank, special thanks to Sister Brenda and, and, and Brother Kirk. Man, they've been a real blessing. They've been coming and praying. Look, I'm telling you, man, y'all need to come pray with us, bro. Like, like, and, it's, and it's not, it, you know what it is? It's like, a, it's like, you know, even whenever Angie is here at times, you know, it's like everybody's Pentecost looks different, but thank God for Pentecost. Amen. I mean, like we ain't all, we're not all loud. Everybody's not loud like me, thank God. But look, all of our Pentecost might look different, but let me tell you something. We want Pentecost in the house. Amen. And and praise God because we we are. We we believe in the in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the movement and the operation of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to encourage you, you know, to let God move in your heart and in your lives. Amen. Praise God, because He will heal you. All right. 
Listen, I, was, I, was, I, the, I felt like the Lord led me to, to this particular scripture because what I want to talk to you, this main scripture that I want to mention to you, it has to do with uh, liberty, freedom and liberty in Christ. Amen. So I titled this morning's message, Freedom is Under the Veil. Now, look, I just want to go ahead and, and read to you real quick. So I'm going to transition 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses uh, 6 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 18. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to switch over to maybe the NASB. The, all these Bibles that I read to you from are literal translations of the Bible. And this is the NASB. It is a literal translation of the Bible. Here we go. This is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church in Corinth, which was near Greece, a very wicked city, by the way. It had two harbors. Just This is just a little side note. It had two harbors down that touched the Mediterranean Sea, and it had a temple there. And at this temple, this is how they worshiped their gods. There were temple prostitutes, okay? And so basically, you would pay money. I know that this sounds crazy, but this is just reality. These pagan religions, and listen, there's a lot of this kind of garbage that goes on in the world. We just don't see it. It's very sexual and sensual, and it's very demonic, okay? But they would pay money. So these sailors would come into these two different ports, and they would go up, and they would pay money to have sexual relations. This is a PG-13 church, by the way. Uh, they would have sexual relations with these temple prostitutes, and that's how they would worship these false gods. So it was very wicked. It was kind of like New Orleans on steroids. And, and the Apostle Paul, you know, planted a church in the midst of this environment, in the midst of this type of age that was that was going on um, and so that's the background commentary on that now there's there's multiple layers to this but to keep it simple one of the layers here is that the people are coming against the the ministry of the apostle paul and they're telling the people in corinth oh you know you don't want paul he's not really preaching the true gospel you know there's other men capable ministers out there you really want them so really one layer to this context is that he's saying what do i need to give you a resume I mean, in a certain sense, that's kind of what he's saying. Do I need to give you some letters of recommendation? Because he said, let me just tell you about the letter of recommendation. The letter of recommendation is your life, my friend. Because the gospel that we preach, the Holy Spirit moved through it, and it did a work in you. And people can see the work that has been done in you. So that's really our letter of recommendation. Amen? And so that's kind of what he's talking about. So he says, who also, talking about the Lord, has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So he's showing a distinction between the Old Testament law and the new covenant, all right? But if the ministry of death, talking about the Old Testament law, the ministry of death, because see, in the Old Testament, judgment came and caused death. If you don't do the law, then you're judged and you die. So he says, if the ministry of death or the ministry of the law in letters engraved on stones came with glory, because God's glory showed up, amen, when he gave them the Ten Commandments, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was. Y'all remember the story of Moses? when he, The Bible says, God said, I talk to Moses face to face like a man talks to another man. And that what would happen is when Moses would walk out that tent, his face was glowing. So he'd have to put a veil on there, right? Now what Paul gives us is a little bit of more information. He's saying, actually, that he, he covered that face because, the, because after a while the glory would start to fade. Because you can see, because that wasn't the fulfillment of the glory. The fulfillment of the glory was yet to come, and the fulfillment of the glory is Jesus. Amen? So he said that, you know, listen, whenever he'd be in there, though, look, they couldn't look on his face because the glory of the Lord was on his face. How will, so if that happened with the Old Testament that brought death, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face 
so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, this is, I want you to see this. This is a big part, of, I think, of what my message is about this morning. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, like even now, the Apostle Paul is saying, that at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. You see what he's saying? He's kind of shifting gears a little bit. He's saying Moses used to put a veil on his face to hide the glory that was fading. But can I tell you something? Even now, 1,450 years or 1,500 years later, the veil still kind of remains over those people's faces whenever they read the Old Testament because they can't see what the Bible's really saying. Have you ever felt that way before? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand for you. That even though you've come to the Lord, even though you love God and you try to read the Bible, that sometimes it, appears, it seems like there's a veil on the Word and we're having a hard time understanding the Bible. That's kind of what the Apostle Paul's talking about. But he's saying that some of these people, they're not really believers, so they can't see there's a veil in the way. All right? So the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. So I got good news for you this morning. If you're in Christ, the veil, if it's not removed yet, it is going to be removed if you will continue to walk with the Lord, amen, and continue to trust God. God has a desire to remove the veil for you. You know how I know that? Because he wants you to understand him. And the only way you'll ever understand him is if you understand his word. You understand how important that is. We want Pentecost up in this church. If I didn't convince you of that this morning, I'll never convince you. But can I tell you something? We want the word of God intermingled with the spirit of Pentecost because if we don't, we'll just end up with a bunch of fanaticism. And how do I know that? Because I got a book in there that will tell you the same thing happened at the Azusa Street Revival. We don't want fanaticism. We want real fire. We want what God wants, amen, and God wants Jesus to be lifted up and glorified, amen? All right. To this day, verse 15, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I got to tell you, I've been thinking about so many things having to do <laughs> even with America. You know, I was in there praying. I know they couldn't hear me because we, we were praying loud and I was like, let freedom ring, Lord, <laughs> you know, it just thinking about liberty and freedom. Now, where the Lord, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I want you to know that this morning, Amen. that wherever the spirit of the Lord is and in your life, there is the opportunity for liberty. Amen. A lot of times we just got to be willing to surrender to the liberty of the Lord. We got to be willing to surrender to the spirit of the Lord. Let the Lord do his work in your heart and in your life. Amen. Amen. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Amen? Praise God. So that's my message. Freedom is under the veil, my friend. Amen? Freedom is under the veil. Sometimes you can't see the freedom, but I got to tell you, it's right there and it's waiting for you. It's just one step away. And this is my main scripture. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. Amen. I know you do. And listen, when you walk out of here and you're driving home, wherever home is this morning, and the enemy tries to jump on your back, and listen, we're about to, we, we're tired of letting the enemy jump on our back. Amen. We got to learn the difference too, and, and we're going to about to get up in some of that before it's over with, about the difference between when the sinful nature is flared up or whenever a demonic spirit is hounding you, hounding you and won't let you go. Because listen, Jesus paid a high price so that you and I could be free. Amen. Praise God. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. So I got a few different scriptures that I want to share with you here in a moment. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You know, the definition for liberty in the, um, in the Strong's was true liberty. Is, is One of the definitions was like this. True liberty is living as we should, not as we please. Isn't that, that's profound, my friend. <laughs> if, you, if you really stop and you think about that. True liberty is living as we should, not as we please. Because guess what? 
you could walk out of here and you could say, dude, this is America. And guess what? In America today, they're allowing people to order CBD gummies or THC gummies over the Internet. And if I want to eat some THC gummies, then I'll eat and do whatever I want. I got liberty to do what I please. Now, besides the fact that I see people pouring into the ER with tachycardic and freaking out because they're getting a hold of too strong of TAC gummies, I'm trying to make a point. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that true liberty is being able to live as you should, not as you please. In other words, I need the liberty from the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to live for Jesus. I want to be able to live for the Lord. I want to be able to walk in freedom and liberty. Jesus paid a high price so that I could walk in freedom. Holy Spirit, do a work in my heart and in my life that I could live my life as I should, a life that would be pleasing to you and bring you glory and honor. Amen? Yeah, I was thinking about America a lot with this particular message. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I've come to this realization. America is not what I always thought it was. I'm not going to get into all that, okay? We'd be here for a long time, my friend. Okay, I only got a few copies of the book left. But, look, America is not what I thought it was. But, you know, what I will tell you is this. It's a whole lot better than anywhere else I've ever been. You know, my dad used to say that all the time. You can't talk about it if you ain't been there, boy. And, listen, I've been to a few different places. Maybe not as many as some of you, but I've been to a few places. And if you've ever been to another nation, you will realize why people want to get over here. You hear me? People don't realize what they're missing if they've never seen anything else. And it's hard to understand freedom if you have never known that you were in bondage. I'm telling you right now, for a Christian, for 12 years, I didn't even know I was in bondage, my friend. Until the Lord showed up one night when I least expected him in an old stinky barroom bathroom. And the Lord began to speak to my heart. And my life has never been the same since then. That was after being a Christian for 12 years. And when the Lord's freedom showed up, I was like, wow, I was in bondage. I didn't even know it. I did not know it. But after that, I knew it. And now, guess what? If I go to tinkering around with something else and I open up some doors, I can assure you I will know the difference. Nope, this ain't freedom and liberty. This right here is bondage. I know the difference between the two. The idea of freedom or liberty as described in this Corinthian passage refers to freedom from the Holy Spirit. Amen. The freedom of a changed heart, a work that's done by the Spirit of God and the hand of God. And the illustration that Paul uses is that these believers were like letters written by the Spirit of God. A letter where the heart was the paper, the hand of God held the pen, and you know what the story was? A changed heart. See, we didn't even get into this because in the first few verses, that's what he was saying. Do I need to get a letter of commendation? Do I need to get a letter of recommendation? But really, you're the letter. That's what he was saying. You're the letter, not written, engraved on stones, but written on your heart. An epistle is what the, le- is what the word in, it translated in the, in the New Testament from the Greek is. You're an epistle, which means a letter that men can read. See, your life is like a letter. When the Holy Spirit shows up and brings freedom, your life becomes a letter. I don't think that I can explain that well enough. It's kind of like, you know, we don't even get mail anymore, really, where we used to correspond that way. I can remember, well, I'm not going to tell old stories, but listen, we used to correspond that way. If somebody was far away, we called it, they call it snail mail now. You write a letter with a pen and a piece of paper. You put a stamp on it. The postman delivered it across the nation. Somebody opens up the letter, and they begin to read it, and they hear a story about what's going on with you over there. That was before we had cell phones. That was before we had IM. That was before we had email. That was before we had Twitter. That was before we had Snapchat. You wrote a letter on a piece of paper and you put it in the mail and somebody opened it up. Paul's saying your life, the Corinthian lives were like letters that people were able to read. When God comes in and he changes your heart, people are reading a letter, my friend. You hear me? The world will never want to let you live down your past, but the world is a liar because their father is the devil. The devil only speaks one language. He speaks lies. Good news is this. If the Lord has changed you, you are a new letter. And then you know what the story is? A changed heart by the power of God, by the hand of God. Don't let the world lie to you. Don't let the devil lie to you. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. 
That's the story. It's a changed, it's a changed life. Amen. The word promises freedom and it promises liberty by the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving us this new life is one of the main blessings of the new covenant. And it's something completely different than your normal religious activity that goes on. Amen. In the new covenant, the spirit of God works in the heart of man. The light of Christ enters in and it allows the believer to see God. Praise God. Whenever Jesus has entered into your heart, has Jesus entered into your heart? If he's entered into your heart, what are you trying to talk about, preacher? I never heard it said like that. If you're born again. If you're born again, you know if you're born again. Amen. And listen, I don't mean this ugly. At any point in time, if you ever go to a camp somewhere or whatever and the preacher says, hey, listen, you want to receive Christ, raise your hand, okay, and, and you know, come to the front, every eye, eye closed, every head bowed, da-da-da-da-da, okay, whatever, whatever. Guess what, though? That doesn't mean you got saved. Now, I'm not trying to say it's bad if you raised your hand and you said, Jesus, I love you and I want to serve you. That's never a bad thing to say that. But just because you raised your hand in a service and you said that does not mean that you got born again. Let me, let me tell you how you'll know you got born again. Ephesians 1.13 says that when you heard that gospel of truth and you believed it, hallelujah, you got a down payment of the Holy Spirit, which is a down payment until the redemption, until the day you receive your glorified body, the Holy Spirit came to move in your heart and you will never be the same again. Oh, you might run, you might rebel, you might do various things, you might go through heartache and, and sorrow and pain, but you ain't never going to be the same, my friend, because you don't got a taste of the Lord. And he's not going to just let you go. <laughs> you might try to run. Oh, I'm going to go to the valley, and I don't even know if it is a valley, in Sonoma, California. I don't know. I'm just going to get away. I'm going to go to the desert where nobody can find me. No, no, no. The Lord knows exactly where you are. He got your GPS. You're pinging right there. He knows where you are. He will find you, my friend. You can try to run all you want. You ain't going to get away from the Lord. So when the light of Christ enters in, when you become born again and the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, guess what? It allows the believer to begin to see God. I say begin because it's just the beginning of the process. Just as literal eyes require literal light to see, spiritual eyes require spiritual light to see. But Paul talked about a veil that covered. Veils are used to conceal or hide something from the view of the eyes so that it cannot be seen, whether it's a deceptive tactic of the enemy or if it's a timing thing from God. Some things are veiled by God because he's not ready to reveal it yet. That's what the whole word revelation means. I've taught you all that before. Apocalypsis, the unveiling. Whenever the unveiling of Jesus Christ, there's coming a day when the veil is going to be removed and the whole world is going to see him coming with the clouds and there's going to be no more confusion, my friend. They're going to know. Some of them, unfortunately, they're going to know. Um, for people like you and me, that day's going to be a glorious day, my friend. Whatever your persuasion is, when it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Hallelujah. Gravity is going to lose its hold, the Word of God says. And you, with the shout of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, we will go to meet him in the air. And we're going to be with the Lord forevermore. So when you find yourself in sorrow and heartache upon this earth, remember, it's temporary. You're in a temporary state of mind. James called it the vapor of life. It's like a whiff. A whiff of smoke, a whiff of, whiff of vapor, and it's gone. This life is nothing but a dress rehearsal for eternity. Leonard Ravenhill said that, not me. This life is nothing but a dress rehearsal for eternity. Amen. Just remember that because guess what? We all feel it, don't you? Don't you not feel it, the heartache and the pain? When things don't go your way and people treat you wrong, you don't understand why. Why they just couldn't have a little bit more compassion. Why they couldn't just endure with me a little longer. Why they couldn't, why they couldn't be more long-suffering, you know? I don't know you would need to ask the same of yourselves, right? Why couldn't I have been more long-suffering? Why couldn't I? But guess what? I just want you to know that this sorrow of this life is temporary. Amen? So Paul talked about veils and that, you look, veils are used to conceal or hide something from, for, from the view so that, the, so that the eyes can't see. And when a person turns to the Lord, <laughs> the veil of religion that hides the real Jesus from view is slowly being removed. Amen? I want you to think, I wrote a little thing in my notes. 
I want you to think about where, what you knew about God yesterday or five years ago or 10, 15 years ago, however long you've been in the faith. What do you, you remember, or even when you first, the, do you remember the first time somebody witnessed to you? <laughs> somebody witnessed to you, right? Do you remember that? You, I bet you if you could, you just thought about that. The first time somebody witnessed to you, it, it brought you back somewhere. Did it not? Should we not stop right now and be thankful for that person that told us something about Jesus? Whether it was our parents, and our parents weren't perfect, we know that. Whether it was a friend at school, right? Wherever it was, somebody somewhere told us about Jesus. I had a, I had, real quick, this is one story. I'm not going to go on and on, I promise. I was in a restaurant here in town recently. And uh, actually, I think it was eating, I was eating with Rich and some of the other musicians. And this guy, I said, yeah, man, I used to know this dude. He was a, well, I don't want to give him away. But anyway, he was a musician, whatever. But I love this testimony because his testimony, it's just, the, I love people's testimony, all right? And that's why sometimes I'll ask y'all, man, how, what happened? How y'all got saved, you know? Because I'm just very interested. Anyway, I love this dude's testimony. So the story goes that he was, a, he was in a rock band, and they were smoking weed, okay? I do not promote smoking weed. Don't smoke weed. It'll destroy your life, all right? Um, I know. <laughs> it will destroy your life if you, because, anyway, just trust me on this, okay? Don't buy the lie of modern society. All right. So anyway, they were smoking weed and whatever, whatever. And one of the guys there was bound up, and he was not serving the Lord, but he started talking about the book of Revelation. And he started talking about judgment. And I said, yeah. I said, hey, t- tell Rich your story or tell whoever your story, man. What about your testimony? Whatever. He's like, yeah, but that guy was just trying to scare me. But you know what I started thinking later on? I'm like, hold on a second, boss. <laughs> Whether he was where he was supposed to be, whether you feel like he was just trying to scare you. I'm just trying to, I didn't say all this to him, but what I'd like to say is you need to slow your roll, dude, because guess what? God used it in your life to change you. So what you really need to do is be thankful that the dude was at least willing, even if he was acting like Balaam's donkey, to say the right thing at the right time. So whatever he was doing, he was talking about the book of Revelation. He was talking about judgment, and all of a sudden the dude's face got all sober, the guy that was telling us the story, and everybody said, what's wrong, man? What you, what you doing? He said, I think I'm going to be religious. And he got up and he walked out the house. And his life ain't never been the same. I'm just trying to make the point. Don't you remember at some point in time in your life when somebody was willing to tell you the good news of the gospel? Thank you, Jesus, for that. That's powerful stuff, my friend. And guess what? You can play the part. God wants you to play the part. He wants you to be a mouthpiece. He wants to live on the inside of you. And when the time is right, he didn't ask you to be perfect. Don't buy the lie of Satan. He never asked you to be perfect. Jesus is the perfect one. And guess what? If the Lord has done something in your heart, you got a story to tell. Oh, but I'm not free. Well, guess what? Well, ain't none of us completely free. We're going to keep on getting more and more free. We're going to keep on seeing liberty as the veil is removed and we see Jesus better and better every day. Main point I wanted to say is, do you remember when you first started walking with the Lord, how very little you knew? And that if you've been in the faith for any length of time and you found yourself some good preachers and you did some good studying, how much you've learned since then? You know what I'm saying? Have you not learned so much? And that's what happens when you get saved and the light of Christ enters in and that spiritual light opens up your eyes and the veil slowly beginning to be removed so that you and I can understand more clearly the things of God. You know, the Bible repeatedly describes God's people being able to see spiritually. But look, the enemy, I'm about to turn to this particular scripture right here, 2 Corinthians 4, which is right below where we were reading earlier. The enemy of your life, in my life, he doesn't want us to be able to see this. Look what it says in verse 3. He said, and look, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who who are perishing. I want to talk about that a little bit to you here in a second. In whose case the God of this world, y'all know who he is? That's your enemy right there. Some old preachers used to call him Slewfoot. The Greek calls him Hapaniros, the evil one. That's Satan. The cult calls him Lucifer because they think he's bringing light. 
I'm here to tell you that's the devil right there. And the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the, in, the, the God of this world is trying to blind the eyes. Now, Paul, Paul says that if, if our gospel is being veiled, it's being veiled to those that are perishing. And if you look at the, in the Greek text, the idea is to unbelievers. But I got to tell you something, the enemy, I'm not trying to give him any kind of glory, my friend. I, I don't like him. He's a pervert. I, I, I hate Satan with everything that's in me, okay? I know that even whenever sometimes I fall to his devices, that he is a liar and he is corrupt and he is the mo it is disgusting. He'll try to show up as an angel of light and prepare himself all beautiful, but he is a liar and he will bring destruction and heartache, untold sorrow and pain, all right? He's trying to, and, but, he, he's, he, but he is slick. The wiles of Satan, the trickery and his devices, the, the Lord does not want us to be ignorant of those things. He's slick. And listen, he changes. He's been here a long time. He's been w observing human behavior for a long time. He's been around since the first day that the doctor slapped your butt whenever you came out your mama's womb and you took your first breath of air, but he's been here a lot longer than that. He's been observing human behavior. He knows you better than, than he ought to, okay? What, I, what I'm trying to say is this, is that it's saying that it's, 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 it's veiled, the gospel is veiled to those that are perishing, but he's slick. He doesn't he done shift the gears on his friend. What are you trying to say? He's in the church. He's in the church. It's not really shifting gears, and we shouldn't be that surprised because Jesus said that the tares would grow amongst the wheat. The disciples, well, he said, he said that the good man sowed good seed in the field. Jesus is the good man. This isn't in my notes. Jesus is the good man. He sowed good seed, which is the gospel, into the field, and then he went away on a journey. And then another one, the enemy came in and he sowed bad seed. And that you don't even know the difference between the two. It's kind of like in a church, you know, not, maybe, not, not in this church. We ain't got no tares up in this church. Amen. <laughs> But at the church down the road, don't go across the road. No, I'm just joking. If the Lord leads you, go, okay? And hopefully he'll come back, all right? But look, so you go to the church across the road because it ain't no tares up in this church. And if you are, Lord, deal with us. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Because tares are poisonous. Half the time you don't even, oh, this is so good. I didn't plan on talking about this. You don't even know what a tear is till it really gets mature. But a tear is poisonous. You know, sometimes believers can be like poison to other believers. You think you're doing good. You think you're all holy. You think you're all that. In reality, you're causing heartache and pain to people. Lord, check our spirit. Lord, check our hearts. Because, listen, I'm talking about myself. I ain't talking about you. Lift your head up high, my friend, because I ain't even talking about you. I'm talking about me. Look, us as believers, we're going to hurt other people. It don't matter whether you meant to or not. I had an old professor in Bible college. He said it don't matter if they preach the, 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 the Bible in error on purpose or accident. It doesn't matter whether they meant to do it. The result is the same. Instead of it re resulting in liberty, it results in bondage. It don't matter whether you meant to do it, preacher. If you're preaching falsehood, if you're preaching lies, if we're living our lives in such a way that it doesn't bring glory to God, it don't matter whether you did it on purpose. You may not be a tear, but you're acting more like one than you are a piece of wheat. And that's what the parable said, that the Lord went on a long journey, and then an enemy came in, and he sowed other seed. And then they grew up together, and you don't even know the difference until it's almost harvest time. Then you realize there's a lot of tares up in this field. And so the disciples said, what shall we do, Lord? Or the workers, what shall we do? Shall we pull up the tares? No, you can't pull up the tares because, see, they're all intertwined. And you start pulling up this one, even if you think that the Lord showed you that so-and-so is a tear, and you go pull, plug that one out, guess what happens? It causes all kind of confusion. The Lord said, let them grow together. And in the harvest, amen, in the harvest, the Lord's going to deal with it. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares, the goat from the sheep, hallelujah. We just got to trust the Lord. Now, I will tell you this. If you're like a dude in the church and you happen to be single, if you're a dude in the church and you happen to be single, you're not supposed to go. Every time a new woman comes up into the church, you don't need to go try to talk to her for her to be your girlfriend. And vice versa. 
If you're a single, it doesn't mean that the Lord won't bring people together. But if your focus is on a new woman or your focus is on a new man, your focus is wrong. Get your focus on Jesus. Amen. And if you'll do that, hallelujah, the Lord will set you free and he'll bring you the right one and the right time. Quit manufacturing your own details of your life. That's the Lord right there. Hallelujah. Because I'm because I don't want I'd rather say it from behind it than have to tell you to your face. Amen. And I will. But I need you to also tell me stuff to my face whenever I need to hear stuff. Amen. I mean, I like it, but Lord help me. I want to be teachable, man. All right. The God of this world is blinding people's eyes. Amen. But what I wanted to tell you is, is that he done crept into the church, my friend. He done crept into the church, and he's brought deception, and he's blind. Because, see, you got preachers, and I'm not picking on other preachers. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I got it all figured out. I know I don't have to over-explain myself by now. Hopefully not. But there's a lot of preachers that stand behind this sacred desk, and they're spewing out pollution. It's like a broken sewer line that's just spilling out onto the street. And it smells like, well, let's just say it in Spanish, popo. It smells like popo. Stinky popo. I went to a jail in Cancun to minister the gospel with Gaudi. Dude, you do not want to go to a Mexican jail, my friend. You thought you had it bad over here? No, sir. You do not want to get caught up in a Mexican jail. The smell of popo is stenching the air. You hear me? And listen, the preachers stand behind pulpits and they're spewing out pollution. And we wonder why people can't ever walk in freedom and liberty because people are bound by false doctrine. You... Do you think that the devil's taking a nap? I'm telling you right now, the devil ain't taking a nap. And if John warned against false doctrine, Paul warned against false doctrine, Peter warned against false doctrine, and we're about to get in a story where Jesus warned against the leaven of the Pharisees, the devil is not taking a nap. He's, the, he is, he's a liar from the beginning, and he speaks a lie. And my point is, is that he's crept into the church, and he's put the wool over people's eyes. To where he's put a veil because it's a false gospel and people can't see. So I want you to see that. As a matter of fact, that kind of transitions me into this Mark 8 story. I'm not going to turn there. I'm just going to kind of tell you the story a little bit. Here's some of the highlights. Jesus fed 4,000 people. This was one, the second time that he fed the, the multitudes. He said, look, we're in a desert place. These people have been following me. Many of them live far away. How can we feed them? Well, we'll never be able to find enough to feed to sustain this people. How many loaves do you have? Seven loaves and a few fish. So he feeds the people. He feeds the multitude. Then in the next scene, he's with his disciples. And then the Pharisees show up. And they demand a sign from him. You know, Jesus, not in this particular chapter, but in another chapter, they demanded a sign from him. You know what he told them? Don't seek after a sign, my friend. We want to see signs and wonders. We want the Lord, but don't seek after a sign. Jesus said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, right? And, and so they said, we, we would have a sign from you. And Jesus said, I'm not giving you a sign. Don't you love it whenever somebody can walk in enough authority and confidence in God that they're like, I'm not, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. Like, I'm not here to, to bow down to you. I, I love that because Jesus had an understanding and a revelation of something that the Lord just gave me a couple of weeks ago. What is that? This earth belongs to me, Matt. This is my place. I created this. I spoke this place into existence. You don't owe anybody anything. Uh, you just serve me, walk with me, and tell other people about me. I own this place. And one day I'm going to wrap all this up, and you're gonna, they're going to all see. Amen? Praise God. But Jesus already knew that. <laughs> this, is, this is his father's house. I'm not going to give you no sign. Whenever Jesus is leaving, he's back with his disciples, and he starts to warn them about the leaven of the Pharisees. See, we're talking about not being able to see because there's a veil over the truth. The word leaven actually means yeast. Y'all knew that, and most of y'all knew that. Yeast in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, specifically represents sin. In the New Testament, Jesus throws a little bit more information on it. It represents false teaching. So leaven or yeast in the Bible represents sin and false teaching. Jesus starts to warn his disciples against the leaven of the Pharisees, the false teaching of false religion. They're, they're so confused. They, it also mentions they forgot to bring some bread with them. And they're just coming off of the, of the miracle of the loaves. And they're like, he's mad at us because we forgot to bring bread. 
And Jesus perceives in their heart, boy, Lord, Lord, let me have the gift of discernment like that, huh? Jesus perceives in their heart. He says, why don't you understand? You don't even, they couldn't even understand what he was trying to explain. To them. Now, the interesting thing is, is in the next scene, now this is in Mark chapter 8, he heals a blind man at Bethsaida. I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. No, these miracles really happen, but at the same time, they're taking place in correlation to teachings that Jesus is allowing all this to happen to drive the point home so that people could see. <laughs> and you can't get any better than that. So he takes this man out. Now, there's probably a whole lot to this story, but he says, come outside of the village. And in the end, he tells him, don't go back to that village. That, there, there's a whole message in that. If he takes you out the village, don't go back to the village. There was obviously something in the village that was going to mess up the man. Nevertheless, he takes him out the village, and he puts spittle on his fingers, and he rubs it on his eyes. And he says, what do you see? Lift up your head. What do you see? I can see some stuff. I see men walking, and they look like trees. So he couldn't see completely, but he saw a little bit better than he could before. So he says, okay, now what do you see? I can see. So what he could not see at all before, he was able to see a little bit better. And then from there, he went to the place where he could see clearly. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that the disciples in the boat couldn't see what Jesus was talking about when he talked about false teaching. And a person that has a veil over the gospel can't see the truth. But when you come to the Lord and the light of Christ enters inside of your heart, he will give you progressive revelation. But that's a big old word, progressive, not really. But it's he will give you more and more understanding as you walk with the Lord. Just sit down, brothers and sisters. Sit down, seek the Lord, soak up God in his word. Amen. Hallelujah. So Jesus fed these multitudes, amen. He heals the blind man. The spiritual eyes of believers are open. But, you know, sometimes it doesn't work that way. I remember old Pastor Brad, I thought that was funny. I mentioned it the other day, so I hope you all don't think that I don't remember that I said it because I'm not getting that old yet. But I remember one time he was preaching a message, and he said, you know, Sometimes you got people in the church and they're still spiritual babes. But what's crazy is you got to part their whiskers to put the bottle of milk in their mouth. Dude, that's, a, that's pretty powerful, right? I know it's weird, but it, he did some, he said some weird stuff, but it drive the point on. Part their whiskers so you can stick the baba in their mouth because they're still spiritual babies. There's nothing wrong. Now, there's another scripture that says, desire the pure milk of the word. So look, like a baby needs milk, you and I need the milk of the word, amen? But at the same time, Paul rebuked Corinth, actually, and said, why you should be a meat eater, you're still drinking milk. So you're supposed to be growing up, you become a carnivore for the word of God, amen? You're a meat eater, amen? Well, so anyway, uh, you know, that was the point, though, is, is the point that I'm trying to make is, is that sometimes people can't see because they don't really want to see. Because they think that they got so much figured out. I'm talking about the spiritually self-righteous. I'm talking about the hypocrite now. I done been there. If you've been in the faith for any length of time, you got to admit to me. I'm not looking at you. But you got to admit that you yourself have thought more highly of yourself than what you ought to because we're all full of pride. That ain't, that ain't being mean. That's just did we straight talk. Maybe we change the name of our church, straight talk. Okay, we're just going to call it like it is. All right. We all been there right? Okay, but what I got to tell you is this, is that, is that people that have an unteachable spirit, many times they stay stagnant. They can't really see what the Lord wants them to see because they cannot see the things in their own heart and lives, and they think more highly of themselves than what they ought to. The Word of God says over and over again, don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought. Amen. See, it's a humble, the Word of God says this, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. Amen. You know, have you ever tried to practice humility? I'm talking about like try to put some skin on it because sometimes it doesn't feel good. As a matter of fact, most of the time when the Lord speaks something to your heart, you'd probably be like, that ain't the Lord. I can remember one time Miss Angela may not remember. This is silly stuff, but this is the kind of stuff where I do sometimes listen to the Lord. Other things pray for me. I probably don't listen to the Lord. But I can remember we had started a restaurant. 
It was called Rosario's Cucina, and it was an Italian Sicilian restaurant, and I went to Castellano's one day. And I was in the line there, and I was telling these people that were in line, I was like, man, I just started my own restaurant, blah, 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 blah. So I'm in Castellano's talking about this restaurant. Nah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, but I'm walking in freedom and liberty, sister. Don't be judging me. I say what I want and do what I want. I'm a king's kid, right? So I'm over here telling this person that, and when I walked out, I kind of felt a little bit of a twinge. Okay, ah, no, 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 that's just Matt thinking. That's just Matt right there. That ain't the Lord. All right, so come, come to find out about three weeks later, Miss Angela needed some brisket or something. I'm like, oh, I can bring them off today. Let's go. Where are we going? Canadas. Pull up at the front door of Canadas. Who's walking up in there? I didn't know him. Miss Angela said, I think that's Chris Castellano, the old man that owned this restaurant. All of a sudden, dude, the Lord starts saying, you need to go apologize for that, man. I feel the Holy Spirit all over there. So I tell Ms. Angela, and I'm, this isn't nothing against Ms. Angela. It's just the Lord was dealing with me. I said, I think I'm supposed to go apologize to that man. She's like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> she didn't say all this, but I'm thinking, come on. That is so embarrassing, dude. Why are you going to? This is completely unnecessary. You don't have to do this. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to go apologize to this guy. Right? And so I walk up there, and I tell him, I say, look, sir, you don't know me, but, and I tell him the story. I was in your restaurant, da 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 He's like, oh, okay. Like, he could not have cared. That, like, you know, I mean, he's still open for business, or at least his kids are. But my point is, he could not have cared more, any more than the man on the moon about that. But it wasn't about him. It was about me. And it was about what God was trying to show me. Just like the time whenever the Lord first got a hold of me. I've told you all this story before, where I had a bumper sticker. I used to go to Cornerstone, and there was a guy named Billy Merrick, and he dressed up like a fisherman, and he was throwing different kind of bait out there. And he said, I won't teach you to be a fishermen and he handed out some bumper stickers and it said fishers of men oh like, yeah give me and this is after the lord got a hold of me dude so i was hungry but i wasn't very mature so i said yeah give me that get, you got something else and so i had it and then one morning i but i used to when i first got saved i told y'all this before i used to have this metallic looking chrome bumper sticker that said god is awesome and I had that on my little Buick Regal or whatever, like my second car I ever had. I was like, yeah, man, God is awesome. Well, so I woke up one morning to go put the Fishers of Men bumper sticker on this other car. And, I, and all of a sudden, I was like, man, this bumper sticker don't really look too cool. In my mind, I was thinking, man, this is kind of like a geeky, nerdy kind of bumper sticker. Because I didn't understand the powerful concept of being a fisher of men. I'm just sharing with you my mindset and how messed up I've been. Amen? So I went to go try to put the bumper sticker on the car, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It was like I was literal. I know it seems silly, but I was having a spiritual struggle in my front yard to put a bumper sticker on the back of my car. I don't understand why I was fi it was fighting me so much. And I said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not putting this bumper sticker because it is an ugly bumper sticker, and it's not cool at all. I'm not putting this on my car. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know how much God loves you? He says, son. If you will put that bumper sticker on your car, because I'm really pretty sure the guy did not really care whether or not I had a bumper sticker on my car. But he said this, if you will put that bumper sticker on my car, on your car, I will teach you something about humility that you could have never known. And he said, by the way, I died naked in the noonday sun on a cross for you. You can't put a bumper sticker on your car. Like, oh, I'm putting this bumper sticker on this car. Pow! And immediately, I'm telling you, immediately when I put the bumper sticker on the car, something happened spiritually. It was like, oh, my gosh, are you even serious? I'm over here fighting over this bumper sticker. And the Lord, he did. He showed me something about humility. What is the moral to the story? I don't know. If the Lord tells you to go do something or say something, or just do it. You might be surprised. I'm talking about practicing humility. Humility is just a theory, and it's a good Bible scripture till we start to practice it. All right, let's get to moving. All right, Proverbs 1. It's a whole chapter. I'm not going to take you down the pathway of Proverbs, the whole, the whole chapter, but I do want to share a couple of things with you in Proverbs 1. Because, listen, we're still talking about freedom and liberty, right? And we're talking about the fact that a veil can cover the vision of what God wants to do. And in Proverbs 1, I want you to know that it talks about this. Look at this. 
I'm going to go through a couple of these scriptures. We're going to actually, just in case you want to know, we're going to cover verse 2, verse 5, verse 7, verse 10, verse 15, verse 23, but I'm going to make it quick. You ready? Here we go. To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to know wisdom and instruction. What a beautiful thing. I love preaching on Proverbs even though I don't have time right now because it always talks about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. I've been talking to people about that lately a little bit. You know, you, you, you don't know nothing about God until you start applying yourself to at least crack the book open and begin to learn. As you begin to learn, you start to learn some things about the knowledge of God. Now that you're armed with some of the knowledge of God, guess what? Tomorrow you're going to have time. You're going to have an opportunity tomorrow, this afternoon probably, to practice the knowledge that you've learned. You, you, are you hear what I'm trying to tell you? If the Lord's trying to teach you about knowledge and he says, I resist the proud but give grace to the humble, he's going to create a scenario to where you can practice that. When you apply knowledge in real day circumstances, it becomes wisdom. It's application of knowledge in real day life circumstances. Knowledge becomes wisdom. And then once you start practicing wisdom, you start to have understanding. You start to understand this world you live in a little bit more like God does. You start to see things a little bit more like God does. Amen. So to know wisdom and instruction and to discern the sayings of understanding. We're talking about God's word. We're talking about understanding. We're, we want the veil to be removed from our eyes. Look at this. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. And a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Can I tell you that wisdom, according to the word of God, is more precious than rubies. It's more valuable than gold. Wisdom, he said, let wisdom be like your sister. Like, treat it like it's the apple of your eye, which is your pupil. Like, I mean, you protect your pupil, wouldn't you? Let wisdom be like a, a, a garment or an ornament around your neck. <laughs> wisdom is, a, the wisdom of God is a powerful, beautiful thing, right? So let, let's go on to the next verse right here. Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Boy, there's some powerful stuff right there. The fear of the Lord, to even come to the realization that God is real and to have the willingness to reverence him and to be concerned about what God thinks. The fear of the Lord is the very beginning of knowledge. But look, fools despise wisdom and instruction. How many times have you and I as fools despised the wisdom and instruction of God? How many times do we know people? Like, like I can tell you right now, and I'm starting to get to the realization, I don't really feel like people are despising me as much. Whenever they may show up one time and not come back, I'm not blaming it on myself all the time anymore. Maybe I preach too long sometimes, but other than that, I'm not taking any responsibility. I think that really and truly what's going on is that sometimes, whether they realize it or not, they don't really love the wisdom of God. That God it doesn't mean they'll never love the wisdom of God. It doesn't, that it, next week they might come back and love it. Okay, a year from now they might come back and love it. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is this, is that it's a fool that despises the wisdom and the instruction of God. You go back out there like Sean used to say, take another lap around the wilderness. Like, you know, my brother Rand used to say, go ahead and take the, the sin challenge or whatever the case. You go back and take another lap. But look, it's a fool that despises wisdom and instruction. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, this is what I wanted you to see. You realize that there's going to be a world, that, that we live in the midst of a world, that there's a sinner around every corner. What are you talking about? A worldling. Sometimes I use that word worldling to describe it, some, some, like from Star Trek. A person that's of the world that's not of God, that's not born again, right? And they're around every corner. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? They're around every corner, and they're trying to entice you. Sometimes they used to be believers, but they're not serving God right now, and they will entice you. He says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Or if they're over there and they're saying, hey, come on, let's go do this. Let's go to this place. Let's go do that. Don't consent to them. Don't walk down the pathway that they're offering. That's the next verse in verse 15. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. 
I, I wish that I really had time to talk about it, but I remember when I first got saved, I was living at my sister Debbie's house on 2nd Street, and some of my friends from Latvia called me out, hey, dude, Mike's parents are out of town and home, and we're coming to pick you up. I got in the car. The Lord said it, get out of the car. What did I do? Like a little muzzled puppy, I stayed in the car. And, you know, and, and, and there I did. I, I played around with these guys for two days. And then I said, dude, y'all got to bring me home because I was so overwhelmed with the conviction of the Lord. Thank God for God's conviction. I, got, I said, dude, no, y'all need to bring me home. So I'm in the car riding home with them. I don't know. I've told y'all the story before, but they were like, do you remember how I told y'all he used to call me Fat Matt? Y'all remember Fat? Fat was so cool, bro. Used to hang out with him. Dude, man, well, I wonder whatever happened to that guy. I'm like in the back seat, dude. What are you doing? And I said it. I said something like, and these guys were a lot tougher and whatever than me. You know, I used to always hang around with people tougher than me. I'm like, man, y'all say what y'all want, but I'm different, man. God touched me. Just bring me home. Bring me home. I wish I would have never got in this car. Amen. <laughs> Lord, don't go. Don't let them entice you. Just stay off the path. Don't, don't consent. All right, now, I wanted to close this proverb part, and then we're about to close the whole thing up. We're going to take communion together. This is what the Lord says, turn to my reproof. In other words, when I bring correction to you and I speak to you, turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you, and this is how I bring it back to the veil, and I will make my words known to you. When you move towards the Lord, when you move towards his correction, the Lord removes the veil and begins to open up your spiritual eyes so that you could see. For, for sake of time, I'm going to ask the singers and musicians to come back up. For sake of time, I'm just going to tell you that there's a difference, that you can't understand God's word in your own natural mind, that it has to be a spiritual work. Amen? John 3, 3 says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen? Can't see it. You can't enter it. You have to be born again. And once you're born again, then the spirit of God is now living on the inside of you. Amen? Now, if you contrast that to 1 Corinthians 2, 14, what does it say? The natural mind cannot perceive the things of God. So if you're not born again, you're never going to understand the things of God. And if you try to see the things of God with a natural mind, you're never going to understand the things of God. Because the sp things of God are spiritually understood. It don't make sense. God don't play by the rules of this earth. Amen? God's God makes up his own rules. And they're in the book. Amen? So listen, I'm going to close with this particular this particular scripture right here, Ephesians 1, verse 18. And we're going to take communion together afterwards. Believers also sometimes have a hard time seeing what God wants them to see. Look what Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. See, I don't know about you, but the first time I read that, I was blown away. I was like, wow, I didn't even know my heart had eyes. My heart's got eyeballs. He's talking about your spiritual man. I pray that your spiritual man would be able to see. I'm praying that for you this morning. I'm praying that for myself, that our spiritual man would be able to see so that we would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Amen. So listen, we're about to take communion. We're going to stand up. We're going to worship the Lord together. And whenever you feel led by the Lord, I want you to eat the bread and to drink the juice. And I'm just going to say a quick word right now about the bread and the juice. Jesus said that Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gave you the bread from heaven. Jesus is the bread that came from heaven. He is our spiritual nourishment. The Bible says that he, this was his body. It would be broken for us. Amen. He died in our place. He was without sin. The wages of sin is death. He died to pay the penalty of sin. He owed no debt. We owed the debt. We couldn't pay it. He paid it for us. The juice represents the cup of the new covenant. That's what we were talking about. That's what Paul's whole message right there to the Corinthians in that letter had to do with the new covenant. That the veil would be removed so that we would be able to see the good news of this gospel. That this cup represents the blood of Jesus that was shed to heal you. The only thing that you need this morning to be able to take communion is that you need to be a born-again Christian. Amen? You need to be a born-again. What, what? I got stuff in my life. Everybody's got stuff in their life. 
You're supposed to ask the Lord to forgive you all day long before you got here. You were supposed to ask the Lord to forgive you. This cup represents why you are forgiven. Amen? That's what this cup represents. When, whenever Paul rebuked the Corinthian church and said, you take the Lord's Supper unworthily, it was an adverb. It wasn't that they were unworthy. They were doing it the wrong way. They weren't recognizing what it represented. This is serious business. Jesus died on the cross to save us from sin. So listen, I just want to encourage you as they begin to play worship music and as we enter in with the Lord, I want you to focus on the Lord is what I'm asking you to do. I want y'all to play a couple songs, okay? Extend the worship out a little bit. And when, listen, when you got to leave, you leave. I mean, and I mean that. This is no judge. judgment-free zone. People got stuff they got to do. But as we start to worship the Lord and you start thinking about the goodness of God and you start focusing on Jesus and thanking him for what he did for you, when you feel led, you eat this bread. When you feel led, you eat the bread that represents the life of Christ that was given for you, that was broken for you. And when you feel led, you drink the cup that represents the cross. Amen. And then I would encourage you, if you need prayer, please come to the front and let us pray for you. Amen.